For those listening online at kcgp.us or maybe through our radio station, or maybe you're watching the live stream via Facebook, I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, where we seek out the Lord by going deeper in his word, going deeper in prayer, going further out as we go deeper. Where we study the Bible line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 13. Let's pick it up in verse 38. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work or work in your days, a work which you will, be, will by no means believe. The one were to declare it to you. Verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. In contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from the region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. Verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening again, we need to hear from you. To speak to us by your, your Holy Spirit. We just pray for a refreshing of your Spirit upon us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In tonight's passage, we will hopefully finish <laughs> Paul's first recorded sermon. He and Barnabas, they are in a synagogue on the Sabbath in Antioch, in Pisidia, which is modern-day Turkey. And he is preaching to Jews and Gentiles alike. Antioch was an inflammable city. It was a melting pot. It had been founded by one of Alexander the Great's successors around 300 B.C. And because Antioch was on a well-traveled merchant route, it had become a Roman colony in 6 B.C. And because of their business acumen, Jews flooded into the city in order to get on the ground floor of business entrepreneurship. The city was a, a mix of Jews, Greeks, Romans, and the native Phrygians who were viewed as emotional and a little high-strung, <laughs> a little hot-headed. It was a rough-and-tumble city, and it had the kind of population where a spark could cause a blazing inferno. This was Paul's audience. Verse 38, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Justified 
We went over that on Sunday means just as if we never sinned. Paul preaching that this man, Jesus, who was crucified and buried, he died, yet he rose and he lives, is the one through whom God offers forgiveness of sins. Paul in his sermon on this Sabbath, insisting that the coming of Jesus, his life, his death, burial, and resurrection is the completion and perfection of history. Jesus was, is, the Son of God. Paul stating the fact that man did not recognize God's consummation when it came in the form of Jesus Christ. Although men in their blind folly rejected and crucified Jesus, excuse me, rejected and crucified Jesus, God could not and would not be defeated. And the resurrection is the proof of the undefeatable purpose and power of God. The Stoic believes history keeps repeating itself. A cynic's verdict is that history is the record of the sins, mistakes, and the follies of men. All unbelievers view life as random chance. It is what it is. There is no creator. There is no designer. All of it is just a roll of the dice. But the Christian's view of history is optimistic. Why? All because of God's perfect plan. God is in control. We, as believers, are certain that history, past, present, and future, is going somewhere according to the purpose of God. God always has a reason. He always has a purpose. He always has a plan. And you see, that knowledge gives us hope. God knows what he's doing. 18 months ago, this church had no live streaming. Our only presence in the community was either here in person at the church or playing on our radio station, our two services locally to those who could get our small FM station. Now we have added via live stream on the internet a total of four services weekly with worship, which goes out to the whole world. We get comments and questions asked on, online all the time throughout America, throughout different parts of the world. God has also added the Refuge Center where we hand out food and the gospel, the good news of Jesus to the community. God knew. He knew what was needed. Even my first year, the vision and the tagline that I came up with, that I came up going deeper. That was an exhortation to get stronger in our faith and in the word. And then this year is going further as we go deeper. An exhortation to go beyond these walls, to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I have to, in all reality, be honest. I didn't really plan that 18 months ago. I didn't have this all figured out. Going deeper sounded good. This year, going further. But God knows. God knew what was needed way back when. And we as believers, those who believe in the name of Jesus, what is happening today in the world is an opportunity to show the world that we are not scared. Why? Because we have Jesus. We have Jesus. And we need to share Jesus. My prayer is that this wakes people up to, evalu to evaluate their lives, for believers to evaluate what they're doing for the kingdom of God, and for unbelievers to evaluate their hearts as we share with them the love of God and the salvation through his son, Jesus. Though the enemy means this virus for evil, God's mercy God's glory 
and sun. They will shine through. And we must recognize the silver linings in the so-called rain clouds. God is in control. He knows. He has a purpose. He has a plan. I was just telling some of the staff this morning the blessing of going strictly live stream. I don't have to iron my clothes. I mean, the camera's so far away, you probably can't tell if I've ironed my clothes or not. I, I have. But you get the point. The little blessings. God is in control and he is working. Because of the persecution of the church in Jerusalem way back, the gospel went out to all the world. And as it did, the Holy Spirit drawing all types of people to God. Now, 15 years later, Paul is in a synagogue teaching, preaching to Jews, Gentiles. He's preaching and teaching Jesus. And Scripture tells us God's word does not go out void. By his Holy Spirit, God draws people into him. He woos them. But not only does God woo people unto him, he also warns them. Verse 40. Beware therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Beware. In some translations, it'll say, be careful. The word is blepo. It means to see, discern, to have the power of understanding, to consider thoughtfully. Paul is saying, hey, wake up. Hear what I'm saying. Understand and consider carefully these words of encouragement, exhortation that I'm giving you. Beware. Such a salvation as God offers is not to be considered lightly, not to be spurned. The cost is too enormous. The benefit's too great. The terms of acceptance, too simple. And the alternative, too final and horrific. To turn down God's offer of salvation is to commit the ultimate unforgivable sin. It is to crucify again the Son of God afresh. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, it says, If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. To reject God's plan of salvation is to trample underfoot. the blood of the covenant. Rejecting the draw and the pull of the Holy Spirit, thus rejecting Jesus, the gift of God the Father gave to us. The unpardonable sin, rejection of Jesus. See, all sin can be forgiven through Jesus unless you reject Jesus, unless you reject Jesus. Verse 41, behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, the one were to declare it to you. Paul, here he's following suit of the Old Testament prophets. He's quoting from the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk, he warned the people of his day of the Babylonian invasion, Habakkuk chapter 1. Isaiah warned the people of his day of the impending Assyrian invasion, Isaiah 28 and 29. And the Roman invasion was only a decade, 10 years away, when Paul here in our passage tonight warned the Jews. But Paul was not merely thinking of the coming Roman invasion of Jerusalem. See, he was warning his listeners in the synagogue that Sabbath of the eternal horrors that awaited those who reject the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. Though our age is an age of grace, our God is righteous. 
And he is a God of judgment and sin must be judged and dealt with. And if our sin is not atoned by the blood of Jesus before we die, it will be dealt with in the afterlife. And it'll be too late. Too late for mercy. It'll be too late for hope. It'll be too late for peace. God is doing work today. His spirit is moving today. He woos us to come, to have a personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus. And he also, he warns us what will happen if we do not hear, if we do not listen. If we choose to not take the gift of salvation and reject the drawing of the Holy Spirit, thus rejecting Jesus. Verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. There was interest in Paul's words and a disposition to believe in particular by the Gentiles. The way the verse is written in Greek, it seems that the Gentiles waited for the Jews, the synagogue leaders, the rabbis, to leave before the Gentiles begged, beseeched, entreated Paul and Barnabas to preach again. And as the following verses will show, the Gentiles, they were passionate about sharing the gospel, the good news in the city. Verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So it seems that there was an after party, an afterglow, and many responded to the gospel there that day in the synagogue. And Paul and Barnabas urged them to continue in the grace of God. Continue means that these individuals had already started to trust in God. Paul knew their decision for Christ, if genuine, would bring them hardship. There would be pressure from the religious leaders, pressure from their friends trying to persuade them for the Jews to come back to Judaism and for the Gentiles to come back to their pagan gods. So Paul encouraged them to continue in the grace of God. See, whenever we make a decision for Christ, a stand for Christ, whenever we step out in faith, the enemy will always try to lure us back into our old ways of sin, spiritual warfare. But as believers, we must carry on. We must be steadfast in Christ. For you see, that is where our power is. In Christ. In Christ. Verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. <laughs> so after the word of God was preached, faith in Jesus came. They heard and believed. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People come to faith by hearing. People come to faith by hearing. That is why we need to speak the gospel. People need to hear the gospel. That is why every single time I have the opportunity teach, to preach. I am going to speak the gospel. If I haven't made it clear now, the only way to see the kingdom of heaven, to have eternal salvation, is believing that Jesus died on the cross, died on the cross for our sins, for our sins, to take away the wrath that was due to us. He took the punishment, and then he was buried. But then he conquered the grave and he arose and he is alive. He's at the right hand of God right now. Only through the blood of Jesus do we have a salvation. Amen. 
And after this afterglow party in the synagogue, the moving and rocking of the Holy Spirit, lives being changed, hearts being reborn. The next Sabbath, Scripture says the place was packed. Almost the whole city showed up. (laughs) That was the power of the Word of God. It affected people, and people noticed that. The Word of God, your belief in Jesus, should be so that it affects how you live your life and be clear to others who and what you believe in. Now is not a time to be a closet Christian. We have what the ailing world needs. We have hope, joy, peace. We have eternal salvation, eternal life, all through Christ Jesus. You want a vaccine for your health? Try Jesus. He will spiritually cleanse you of all of the filth of this fallen world. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. The Jews in this verse, meaning the synagogue leaders, the religious, pious rabbis. Oh, how Satan hates to see people come to Christ. Satan was, is envious of God. No different his minions. It was envy that moved the Jews to hand Jesus over to Pontius Pilate. It was envy that moved the Jews to turn against the apostles. And it was now envy that moved the Jews of the dispersion to turn against Paul and Barnabas. Filled with envy, they threw caution to the wind and took violent exception to the gospel. The synagogue Jews, the leaders, had never seen such crowds. Almost the whole town showed up. So they started to oppose the word of God spoken by Paul by speaking against him. Opposed. It means adversary. That's what the word Satan means. Adversary. Opposer to God. The world, the enemy, Satan will always try to mock the word of God, tear down the validity of the word, diminish the cross and debunk the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In today's world, there is always such vitriol against Jesus. Why? You can talk about God all you want, and people, for the most part, will listen, pleasant, But when you bring up Jesus, them fighting words, gloves come off. Let's go. Why? Because Jesus represents the cross, which represents sin. And sin represents a need for a Savior. And people, they don't want to acknowledge their sin. They don't want to acknowledge their failings. They don't want to acknowledge that they need a Savior. I can do it on my own. I'm good. It's all right. You don't need to preach to me. I know where I'm going. Hey, if I'm going to hell... I got a lot of friends. We'll just have a good time down there. Wake up. When you bring up Jesus in a conversation, (laughs) it can get heated on their part. Turns to hate, rage. No different here with these Jews. They didn't want to hear about Jesus, so they opposed Paul. He had hoped to evangelize his own people. This was his own backyard. He grew up here. This was his stomping ground. But they would have nothing of it. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas, they made a critical decision led by the Holy Spirit, became bold, spoke truth. It was necessary that we start with you. But since you reject it, in some translations, 
put it from you. The word in the Greek means to push away from one's self, to thrust away, to refuse. Jesus will never, ever drag you up into heaven with you kicking and screaming, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. It's not going to force you. That's not how he works. But God, in turn, will also not close the doors to hell if that is where you so choose to go. See, he gives us a free will to decide for ourselves. He will never violate the sanctity of our free will. See, he loves us too much. God, he doesn't want robots. He wants relationships. He wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with you, with I, with us. The Jews rejected Jesus. So Paul said, fine. We're going to move on to the Gentiles, to those who would listen and believe. Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. To this audience, the synagogue, Paul, he quotes from Isaiah 49, verse 6. The Lord's commission to his perfect servant became Paul's reason for turning to the Gentiles. He goes to Scripture. He goes to Scripture. Paul never acted without spiritual authority. Never. For what he did, we should be no different in everything, in all that we say and do. It should derive from the Scriptures. Our words, our actions, even our thoughts, all should be examined and approved by Scripture. The bottom line, the question is, in whatever we do, does it glorify God? Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. It is always cool to see a decision made by the will of God endorsed by the Holy Spirit in blessing. Here it says, the Gentiles, they were glad and they glorified God. A work of the Holy Spirit will always, always glorify God. Luke, again the writer of the book of Acts, tells us that as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Here we have the interaction between the predestinating foreknowledge of God and the human response and responsibility. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 states, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God is omniscient and omnipresent, all-knowing, everywhere. Those are some of his attributes. He is the I am, dwelling in the eternal present tense. He was present in the beginning. He was present when he breathed out the stars. He was present when he fashioned Adam out of dirt, out of clay. And he was present at the synagogue that Sabbath in Antioch. He can appoint people to eternal life because he knows those who will respond and those who will reject the gospel. We must remember that true knowledge is based on fact and fact is there to be known. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. The good news of Jesus spread throughout the area. Now, the Gentile world had been exposed to Greek reasoning, to Roman rule and Hebrew religion, and none of it truly satisfied. None of it truly filled the heart of that missing peace, P-E-A-C-E, that peace which Jesus gives. No wonder the gospel of Jesus spread 
See, the world has always been looking for that peace that eludes them. Verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from the region. Again, here comes the opposition. The word devout means the religious, prominent, good standing, influential. So the religious Jews, the synagogue leaders, the rabbis, they enlist the religious, influential, powerful women and men of the city to kick out Paul and Barnabas. <laughs> Don't want to mess with a woman who's all riled up. <laughs> and that's fine. P and B, Paul and Barnabas, they've had enough. Verse 51. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to an Iconium. Verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The command to shake the dust off of your feet appears four times in the New Testament. In each case, the command is spoken by Jesus to his disciples when he sent them out two by two. Read about that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, and Luke chapter 9, verse 5. In Mark chapter 6, 11, Jesus says, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 15, Jesus clarifies his meaning. His meaning. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Wow. Shaking the dust off one's feet conveys the same idea as our modern phrase, I wash my hands of it. Shaking the dust off the feet is a symbolic indication that one has done all that can be done in a situation and therefore carries no further responsibility for it. It was a saying that the Jews would say when leaving a Gentile city. See, all Jews view Gentiles as filthy. The Jews didn't want any filth to come home with them, so they shook off their sandals when they left a city. Here, Paul and Barnabas were saying, you want to live in your spiritual filth by rejecting Jesus? Fine, fine, we're done with you. You made your bed, now you're going to have to sleep in it. Verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Though Paul and Barnabas, they had to leave their new converts. The Holy Spirit didn't. He filled them. He filled them with joy. He filled them with himself. See, the Holy Spirit is there to encourage us, to comfort us, and when needed, to convict us. The Holy Spirit is there to teach us, to guide us. Their joy resounded throughout the city. The Jews might have been able to drive out the evangelists, the servants of God, Paul and Barnabas, but they could not drive out the Spirit of God. Though the missionary has to move on, the Holy Spirit knows how to nurture and nourish his own. Jesus stated that he would never leave his disciples. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, he states, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. No matter what is happening around us, be it a catastrophe, calamity, crisis, Jesus, he promises to never leave us. Never leave us. He was always, always just a prayer away. I'm going to end with Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong, and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go, wherever we go. We're not alone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you for your words of hope, encouragement, peace, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus as a gift to us for eternal salvation because you love us. And I thank you, Jesus, that you willingly came, 
You left your throne, your throne in heaven to come here. This fallen world, this cesspool. I thank you for your sacrifice. I pray that as we wake up tomorrow morning, that we tell ourselves the gospel, the good news of you, Jesus, and what you have done for us. I pray that we remember that you are our hope and that you are our peace. I pray that the Holy Spirit just fills us to not be afraid but to be bold and to trust in God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.